I know this this is an important issue that uh, people in, in Des Moines, well, it, it's, it's commonly felt that, that low-income people have a tendency towards obesity, and a lot of that's due to the loading up on cheap foods, and breads and macaronis and that type of thing. And in Des Moines, it's, it's very common to see people taking these types of, of sacks of bread. You can buy them for $1.50 and taking them home uh, for human consumption. Recently, I talked with members of the Polk County Mediation Center, and they were relating the, the idea that the added stress that comes um, from cutbacks of social programs brings them more business. And they say if, if the June 30th uh, cutoff, or if the June 1st cutoff for food stamps comes through, that they expect their business to increase 30 percent. And I talked with this uh, patrolman who thought that his business would increase 50 percent if the food stamp program, if the food cutoff comes in June. Uh, he went on to say that this neighborhood will turn itself upside down if, if that cutoff comes. I was in a low income area in Des Moines. And that's the last slide. And, uh, at this point, we could turn the, the lights up and have some discussion. raise very practical problems. Why this interest in the nature of the interrelationship between these two medical systems? In both the developed and the developing countries, there is a remarkable interest in looking for answers to the nature of the interrelationship. At one time, it was a commonly accepted uh, belief that biomedicine or Western medicine or scientific medicine with its rationality, that is science-based rationality, would quickly dominate many parts of the world. This was the belief that of science-based rationality resulting in rapid change of health-related behavior 
people in both the developed and the development world will comprehend the ethos inherent in these biomedical institutions. But in recent times, both in the developed and the developing countries, we're beginning to be less complacent. We're beginning to raise questions. One, in the developed countries, in Western societies, Western scientists, Western research workers who are interested in the place of man and health systems are questioning whether biomedical theory is comprehensive enough. There is a serious question about whether scientific medicine, we are using these three uh, concepts, but I think I will look and accept this biomedical uh, model for obvious reasons, because it is the uh, predominant uh, concept now. We are shifting from uh, the concept of scientific medicine or the concept of uh, Western medicine. So then what I'm saying is that we are beginning to question whether biomedical model is comprehensive enough. Inherent in biomedical model, that is scientific medicine, is the germ notion of disease. But from a philosophical point of view, that is when you look through the history of ideas, you could trace the beginning of this theory, biomedical theory. It is a reductionistic theory. That is, at one point, even most of us who have done a philosophy of ideas will find Descartes' preoccupation with the mind and the body. And for that reason, we get an idea that the scientific quest, the scientific understanding of the body, that is the materialistic conception of reality, became the fashion. And even before Descartes' time, that is the 17th century, we get into uh, specific ideas from the Christian orthodoxy. That is, the Christians with their preoccupation with uh, uh, the mind, the spirit, which is very important, give more or less like a written permission for the scientists of the age, Aristotle and others, to be preoccupied with the body, which was not so important. So here, what am I saying? I'm drawing our attention to the interest that in this day and age, in Western countries, in the developed countries, we're beginning to know that the reductionistic theory inherent in biomedicine is quite narrow, and we need to look for more comprehensive ideas. So then we trace the history of uh, scientific medicine or biomedicine, and then we get into the idea of looking at the body as a machine, you see. Presently, it makes sense because we have brought in the outlook somehow that um, the human conception of the body as a machine is the basic underlying theoretical preoccupation by the medical scientists in biomedical uh, institutions, that is scientific medicine. Because it is a scientific quest for knowledge, isn't it? It's analytical science. Analytical science tells us that we need to isolate organisms. We need to dissect, open the body, isolate, look for unity, cause and effect type of relationship. The whole could be understood, both materially and conceptually, and the whole can be understood, just like management objectives of the human body, you see. So then, with this mind-body dualism firmly established, we get improvement in the material aspect of this scientific quest. That is, when you are sick, this materialistic conception of reality will tell us that the doctor will have to look at it analytically and break down the machine, look at it, um, then repair this machine, and then say you're cured. And here we know that this scientific approach to disease began, and it has got a tremendous success, there's no doubt, in my country, in Ghana, in many parts of the world, you look at the statistics, quantitative 
indicators, you find that um, the disease pattern is being lowered, mortality rates. We are also finding also that uh, the life expectancy. But we can raise philosophical questions about this that should we live for 70 or 80 years. But the point I want to direct your attention to is that uh, there is this realization. Therefore, biological medical approach to disease, I have argued, has been successful beyond all expectations, but at what cost? At what cost? My friend David Warren, uh, Mike Warren uh, mentioned uh, appropriately the cost aspect of this. But I think there again, in many societies all over the world, we are worried about the cost. The cost in terms of finance, the cost in terms of human happiness. Then also, another rationale why there is an interest to look for another paradigm or to broaden the paradigm of this uh, biomedicine theory is that we're beginning to see, because of the success, this is one of the unintended social consequences of medicine. We are living longer, and we are living all types of chronic diseases. We are looking at cases where doctors are more concerned about uh, hypertension. The biomedical reductionistic theory is exclusionistic. It's exclusionistic. In the sense that, when, how do you explain, within the concept of germ theory, about mental diseases? How do you explain within the concept of the germ theory about chronic uh, diseases. But people are living longer and they're raising all types of questions. People are now raising questions about nursing homes. Is it the place for us to end our life? What I'm di directing our attention to again, I must stress, is that because of the capacity, the technological built up into by medicine, I think it is interesting for biomedical scientists to raise these questions because they have the capacity to search for new paradigms. This is the point I'm trying to make. That is, from the point of view of the narrow reductionistic type of theory, and as a, also as a result of living longer, we are beginning to see a new disease map. And this new disease map, like Thomas Zass, in his uh, uh, book about the myth of mental illness, is raising all type of questions. And I think I add my voice to say that it is precisely because of the narrow reductionistic theory, because the re reductionistic theory is exclusionistic. If people are seeing witches, if there is a grief, if diabetic mellitus, people are seeing so many types of signs, how do the doctors uh, deal with these type of things? So the doctors are becoming a bit more humble, and they are arguing that we should look for new type of systems. Then in my own country, Scientific medicine or biomedicine came into Ghana with contact with uh, colonialism, with the missions. The missions did some work by locating hospitals in the area of influence. They were quite sympathetic with the rural people and the poor. So many of the hospitals we see in the rural areas can really be dedicated to the good works of the missions. But in coming into contact with the colonial rule, that is the British uh, colonialism, we see the historical beginnings of uh, the development of scientific medicine. What is important as a rationale is that in the 19th century, because of the nature of the society, and also the type of settlement, we find that the hospitals and the clinics are located mainly in the urban centers, in the cities. But then in Africa, the demographic structure shows that majority of the people, about 70% of the people, live in rural and outlying areas. So where 30% of them live in the cities and principal towns. We see the location and the beginnings of the growth of scientific medical systems. Then socially, when you look at some of the reasons why we have this imbalance, that is the location of uh, 
biomedical systems in the urban centers. We then get into analysis of the type of institutions we have, that is the institutions, the hospitals. In our own researches, we see this following pattern, that in training doctors and other paramedical personnel, they need to acquire a long system of training. They need to use sophisticated technology. Then also, as a result of uh, the method of operation that is using scientific analysis to determine the cause and effect relationship, whether the person is sick or not, you need to have certain support systems, physical support systems, electricity, for example. And for that reason, you could come to a conclusion that biomedical institution operates in style. It operates in the urban areas. It is a modern institution. It has to find certain types of support. And immediately you get into this type of analysis, you see clearly that the rural people in Africa and in other places where rural population like we have in Africa exist, the rural people will not be able to benefit from biomedical clinics. This type of argument the doctors have argued is not wholly true. The argument is that in all systems you need to have concentration of the good hospitals in the center for efficiency, for referral. But in about five years ago, five, six years ago, a friend of ours from Cambridge, Shepherston, did an analysis of this point to determine whether the doctor's argument is quite tenable. That is the argument that uh, many of these uh, hospitals in all parts of the world, the specialist services must be located in the center because uh, the rural people will have to be referred to these centers. So it is for all of the people in Ghana or all of the people in Africa. But we find that the traditional reply to criticism of the degree of this urban concentration of scarce resources of manpower as explained by Shepherson goes as follows. Any health service must have some better equipped centers to serve as reference hospitals and inevitably these must have more than their fair share of specialists, doctors, and so on. This thesis would be valid enough if referrals on a significant scale did in fact occur. However, the evidence is rather clear that they do not. The statistics we have compiled in the Division of Ministry of Health in Ghana carried out uh, with uh, about 2,600 patients in five regional hospitals in 1966 to 1976. It was based on a random sample of inpatient at five major hospitals in the country. That is, these hospitals are situated in the urban centers. We find that if, in theory, the concentration of physicians in urban major hospitals are justified by the usage as referral centers, it is still difficult, I find, to resist the conclusion that in practice hospitals, even the largest ones, have a comparatively restricted radius of influence and confer really all the referral benefits of their services on those who live a few kilometers away. So that is, in terms of demand and supply, we are talking about the Ghanaian context, where there are a few urban located hospitals and specialists. And we are saying that many of the patients who are referred to these hospitals still come from a radius of about three kilometers. Therefore, the argument still stands that there is a need for us in the developing countries to concern ourselves with a quest for a new uh, model of life. Referring. Then I come to my second point. That is the place of uh, traditional medicine. I have argued the interest in both the developed and the developing countries that there is now this remarkable interest. So we are going back 
to be humble enough to look at some of these things, these traditional healers, which in the earlier times we used to make all types of uh, ridiculous remark about them. We call them the witch doctors, the juju. But now we have reached a point, a point I call is cool de sac. Where are we going from here? Should we turn back and then apologize to them and look at it? And it seems to me this is the humility built in science. A science is based on a moral relativity. Science, there is a built-in self-correcting mechanism. And so this is a very positive science for all people in all this world to have this type of a humility to go back to look at the traditional medical institutions and to look at what they're doing, their raising dietary, their logistics. Therefore, the interest is quite a, a very remarkable one. And in the Ghanaian situation, uh, many people have studied it. Uh, we have uh, an umbrella concept, which we call the traditional medicine. And I think it needs some definition. Here, here with works by Dr. Warren's uh, uh, good work in uh, Ghana, uh, he has an aspect of uh, studies in traditional medicine. In a recent publication, edited by him, this African Therapeutic Systems, we get into all types of ideas, concepts, and issues. But I think I will take a definition which we need some explanation. Uh, I will take a definition which will also be intellectually rewarding, that is intellectual, to be simple definition. Uh, I have argued that uh, scientific medicine, the most important conceptual frame of reference is this germ theory, this scientific methodology looking for cause and effect, very empirical, based on invasion theory, isn't it? Then when we come into the traditional medicine, it's also based on invasion theory. But I think in specific forms, we say traditional medicine utilizes social causation. Social causation theory. That is, when a person is sick, we raise questions about the environment, the questions about social relationship, networks. And then the argument is that in certain types of illnesses, the traditional healers, which we shall discuss very soon, will refer to some of these uh, relational disputes, refer to some spiritual agencies, will base their ideas on ancestral worship, because the basic assumption is that uh, the individual, in his quest for good life within the society, must keep in good relationship with his environment, must keep in good relationship with his people. Here we are describing a society uh, where the interaction is face to face, where there is a, a large degree of emotional uh, content because of the day-to-day -day interaction. So it is not surprising for the traditional medical people to develop a philosophy of some kind which fits into the culture of the people. And this too uh, directs us to Another important idea about medical systems. Medical systems have broad ranging ties of sociology. It has broad ranging ties with the total way of life of a people. And for that reason, a, a country's medical system, like this traditional medical system I'm describing, fits into the general ethos of the traditional society. So I have mentioned the social causation theory. Then in terms of a comparative analysis, we mentioned that in the Descartes idea of the uh, 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 dichotomy between the mind and body, the traditional medicine see it in a holistic fashion. They think the individual has the mind. The individual in the present uh, World Health Organization division um, uh, accepts the physical, the social, and the psychological aspect of mind. And so when you simplify it and look at the mind-body dichotomy, which Descartes did, and which has been very efficient vis-a-vis -vis in developing a scientific medical model in its specific treatment of acute ills. We, we are saying that in the traditional medical institutions, there is no distinction between the mind and the body in a general sense. We will talk later about uh, some of the deviations. So what does that mean? In, in modern terms, when you do cost-benefit analysis, then you can argue that this general comprehensive type of theory is very weak, isn't it? How can you measure efficiency? How can it treat? You see, these are some of the questions generally we raise. But there again, 
uh, I will elaborate a bit on this traditional medical uh, definition. This is not to argue that traditional healers don't use herbs. They don't use therapeutics. They use therapeutics. They have sedatives and all types of uh, diseases. And even some studies have shown they bandage wounds. They set bones. But it seems to me, and I maintain, that the most important underlying theoretical paradigm is the supernatural assumptions from which the general theory springs from. And these supernatural assumptions fit precisely within the context of traditional society. There are all types of traditional uh, healers. But basically, we can outline, um, I think, four basic types of traditional healers. The first one we will call the herbalist. As the name suggests, they concern themselves with treating serious illnesses and specific illnesses with herbs. It's very nutritional, not synthetic preparation. They get it from trees. There is a, a long history about the socialization of these herbalists. And when you look at the socialization of the herbalist as a case in point in traditional medicine, you could see that all doctors in all societies have got a specific pattern to train the young ones, the young recruits. See, it varies. They, they have an admission criteria, you see, though we may want uh, grade 12 or grade 13, and uh, physics and uh, uh, biology, chemistry, and mathematics or something, they too, they know, but it is very particularistic, their criteria. They understand it. And uh, uh, in uh, our, our researches, we, we have found how in the initial one-year period, the apprentice undergoes a period of uh, observation, orientation. You see, they don't tell the apprentice uh, the serious things, just in case you resign and then uh, you give the secrets away. See, so th this is also uh, an important aspect of the socialization. Because I'm saying that uh, they, they go through a long period of socialization and they know the type of people who will stay within the context of the traditional medicine. You see, and there it, you must understand it from the point of view that we are describing a particular type of a society. And uh, the whole general idea is that many of these healers, they are not uh, spending all their time, you know, treating ills. That is the herbalist. Uh, the herbalist is a generalist. And I think from sociological angle, we know that in rural uh, traditional societies, there are more uh, generalist than the specialist. So then we get into a situation where the herbalist may be a, a farmer, the herbalist may also be a carpenter, and uh, in the evenings he may also treat. But what is interesting also about uh, the description of the herbalist is that as the nature of the trade, it is kept within the family, you see. The growth of scientific theory is quite a different universalistic uh, model where you, you share your uh, research fundings. You, uh, because of the nature of the scientific community, you meet and you discuss uh, your research findings. For example, say Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin at one point has to share it. But I think some of these herbalists we have seen, they keep it within their own uh, family tree, which is the basis of uh, the kinship uh, relationship. Then we have also the fetish priest. Um, I have described the fetish breed in my book, Medical Systems, because I think they are a fascinating group of uh, people uh, to, st to study. The fetish priest or priestesses, both men and women, they utilize um, rituals, divination, they utilize also possession, which is institutionally required. Uh, there may be some drumming, uh, which is also institutionally required. But I think these things I'm specifying, when you do a comparative analysis, you could see clearly that uh, 
in the development of the professional fetish priest, uh, he or she passes through four or five uh, criteria, which is also common to all professionals. That is a development of a, a particularistic body of knowledge. The body of knowledge is particularistic, and uh, you acquire it through a long period of training, right? Then, when you develop this particularistic body of uh, knowledge, you become a person in a superordinate, vis-a-vis -vis subordinate type of relationship. That is, the, the, the patient comes to you, and the, the person who comes to see you, interested in his uh, thinking is that he does not know what he is he's suffering from, and that he will take your suggestion. It is a superordinate, subordinate type of relationship. And I think this is very important, because uh, the lay person has not that type of knowledge. And this fetish priest has that particular type of knowledge. And uh, for this reason, there is an interesting relationship. There are certain types of uh, diseases, illnesses, which may go to these fetish priests. And we have found out that even in the cities, I have suggested that scientific medical institutions are prevalent. But then because of the reductionism, you know, acute ills, malaria, uh, Bilharzia, appendicitis, surgery, will go into the doctor in, in the city. But then when questions are raised, even among students, how then do I pass my exams? These are questions people are asking. How then can I keep my wife? How then can I keep my friend? These are questions. They are health questions. The people who are raising these type of questions wouldn't go to the doctor. Why? Because they know clearly that the doctor will think that there's something wrong with you. I mean, how can you tell me that you, you, in a dream you saw that uh, there were witches dancing around you? But people are grieved. And for that reason, there is a, a real indicator to show that in the bizarre uh, psychosomatic illnesses, mental illnesses, schizophrenia, and quest for happiness. These people will go down or will go up to see the fetish priest. When you go to see the fetish priest, she gives you a very reassuring welcome. She wouldn't ask you the old classical scientific question the doctors will raise, what is wrong with you? She will say, I knew you were coming. And that alone is uh, therapeutic. She knows. Why should she raise questions? Die. And then quickly, if you have, quote and unquote, so-called scientific mind to say, to dismiss it. Oh, it's not true. But W.B. Cannon's analysis in the American uh, uh, anthropologist was very, very interesting. He was able to analyze some of the physiological things which would take place as a result of the fact when the person is sad, one or very, very anxious or nervous, the adrenaline secretion over secretion, then here it will affect the whole blood electrolyte system. Then in terms of uh, being depressed, you're not able to eat. And if this goes on, you get into a cycle which is vicious of some sort. And for that reason, if you believe in it, because belief system is a very important aspect in this uh, analysis we are making. And for that reason, um, W.B. Cannon tells us a very important point. That is, from a differential functionalist analysis, there are a whole series of people with the belief systems who utilize different therapists. And I'm suggesting that when a person goes to see the fetish priest, then the basic assumption is that he is that type of person who is more suggestive, and for that thing, it is very therapeutic. The same thing recently, not recently, in the 60s when we were students, we find that uh, Hollingshead and Reddish's analysis of the uh, social class and mental illness, you know, they, they tell us a very interesting thing, that you shouldn't dismiss it. The doctor, this psychological confidence issue, it's not all that quantitative, looking at your blood pressure and all those type of things, but that moral suasion, that confidence, when you believe in somebody, it goes a long way, and that is the main psychotherapeutic potential of many of these healers. So the type and nature of the people who patronize these things are important. Because uh, in my analysis of professionalization, I was suggesting that these uh, fetish priests and the herbalists developing a, bod a body of knowledge gives them a very important position. They have authority. 
And this authority gives them that chance to determine social action. That is, you believe in them. So actually, in, in uh, this analysis, you could see that when you go in to see the fetish priest or any doctor of some sort, but importantly, the fetish priest, the fetish priest utilizes this position. And the fetish priest, like the doctor, deals with, not with customers, but he deals with clients. And professional client relationship is one of superordinate subordinate relationship. The argument is that you don't know. And so when even you do suggest that you have a headache, I have every right to tell you that you don't have a headache, but you have cancer. Why? Because you know I know. And so you have uh, uh, given me a legitimate authority to sanction you. And it is important. Though there are a few deviations as a result of uh, knowledge and all these, when the doctor says you're suffering from this, you can hunt if you have the doctors available other places. And we have seen patients going from place to place, is he hunting for different in their quest for therapy. Then, in terms of the fetish priest again, for professional uh, emphasis, they have this ethics, body of ethics, that many of them we have covered uh, expected not to kill or to use their medicine to kill uh, a anyone. But then uh, it's another c uh, group of uh, healers, too, like they call healers, they perform differently. But the fetish priests also have this um, ethical knowledge because of their powerful position. They have to have uh, ethics of some sort, and they also have certain types of community sanctions in terms of uh, determining whether is going to keep in practice or not. But with this community sanction, I find it very interesting. You see, in, in normal analysis, when you get into community sanction, then you get into demand and supply. That is, if you find so many patients going into this particular fetish priest, then your argument is that this particular fetish priest is uh, very efficient technologically. That's why he's getting more. But then we have found out that these fetish priest argument is that I asked one, and she told me that a patient, when a person is sick, the person has three chances. One is to recover. The second one is to continue to be sick. Then the third one is to die. But as a result of the supernatural assumptions in terms of magical religious assumptions they have, it is quite clear that uh, the second argument of this fetish priest is that he or she is trying to help you. You see, it's a particularistic society. It's helping you to recover. And uh, she's not charging you immediately any fees, you see, which fits also into the society. So she's helping you. And she also knows the idioms, the philosophy, the whole background of the society, that the ancestors are there to uh, protect you. Therefore, what? Therefore, if you are sick, it means you have got social deviation. You have done something wrong against society. Therefore, he is only trying to help you by using all these techniques. You see, and you understand this type of language. So if he or she does not succeed, it's not her fault, but your misfortune. Then it comes to the time of payment. There again, do you understand it from the broad understanding of uh, a Gamenshaft society, you know, a society where there's kindness, effective interpersonal relationship. The fetish priest dances all night around you. Uh, if she prescribes a soul-free diet, she is also not eating the diet to make sure that you really believe in him or her. And uh, so when you recover, she will at least inform you that you have been at the verge of death. And for that reason, you must do something. And you know, sometimes, I have talked to some of my friends, you may even end up paying more than is needed to be paid. But that is uh, besides the point. The point is that uh, they're using the whole traditional uh, thing. I, I have seen, I interviewed some patients, and they were really saying that uh, in terms of Ghana, uh, scientific Western uh, model where the government subsidizes heavily, uh, the, these traditional healers uh, charge a lot because sometimes you have to uh, pay so many uh, things in cash or in kind. Then we have the, the, bone, uh, the bone setters. 
with the as speciality. And uh, they also, as I said, they may be doing some other things and they get some people and they use certain types of experiments, you know, with uh, animals or with uh, chicken. And uh, they also apply some helps. Then the cult healers, the cult. Uh, this has been studied by uh, Barbara Ward's uh, analysis of the cult healers, which is very interesting in here. I think uh, the cult healers came in, according to her analysis, she was saying that as a result of a society in transition, there are a whole series of uh, new cults emerging in the cuckoo growing uh, areas to meet with the demands. So I think for our understanding, the important thing is that these uh, healers are also specialized and these healers are also responsive to the demand of the time. Then in recent times, uh, in, the, in the recent article by um, one of sister and also Mike Warren in the uh, MAN, that is uh, this <coughs> anthropology newsletter, medical anthropology newsletter, November 1970. Now we get into a very interesting area which I put under the a traditional healers, that is the traditional birth attendants the traditional birth attendants. They are the midwives, the midwives. In Africa, a recent booklet by the World Health Organization also supports the, pen, uh, the point made by these authors I have mentioned that about 80% of the deliveries are performed by these uh, traditional midwives uh, within the age group of about 55, 60. In every village, we have them. So then the argument then is being made that in all known societies, we have basic institutions. And this medical institution shows clearly that medical institution is a universal institution. Therefore, in Ghana, I have been able to characterize two pluralistic medical systems, two systems of medicine, the traditional healers and then the Western biomedicine or what I sometimes call the scientific medical systems. Now the question is to look at the interrelationship and to see the emerging paradigm, that is the emerging way out, which again I will argue is of interest to all of us, both the developed and the developing countries. Because I have mentioned in my introductory remark that uh, scientific medicine is very reductionistic, and there are a whole series of uh, chronic ills as a result of the good intentions, the technology of uh, scientific medicine. People are living longer. People are no more dying quickly as they used to die, but they are all becoming uh, chronics, those who are sick and that type of thing. And for that reason, there is now this search. Then I've also mentioned that in our society too, because of the unequal distribution of the resources, unequal distribution. That is, you can predict with a certain amount of certainty that in all the African countries, in many of the third world countries, when we have 1,000 doctors, about between 80 to 90% are in the center. And it is easy to explain. And I don't think we need to bother about it because they live in style and they need to have some social support, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedical men. Then I've also suggested about uh, the scientific uh, medical institution's difficulty because of its methodology, its scientific quest for cause and effect type of relationship. We, we get into situations where there are whole series of support systems like x-ray, we talk about blood analysis, then you're talking about electricity. In many parts of the African rural environment, these urban dwellers have not been able to provide electricity for many of the people in the rural areas. Then in recent times, we are also getting into situations in the developed countries, say in Ghana, where the rural people are becoming poor. The rural people are the most productive people. And there are documentations, agricultural society, they have the capacity and the social organization to grow the cocoa. 
In Nigeria, the groundnuts scheme. In Nigeria, in Kano, we find the good works of these rural people in cotton production to supply the raw materials to feed industries. We also get into situations where in Kenya, we get into the coffee and others. So my argument then is that as a result of this parasitic relationship between our cities and our rural people, there is a very interesting development. We don't get the hospitals. We have not yet analyzed the therapeutic potential of these traditional healers. The doctors, immediately you ask them that they should go to the rural areas. They won't go anyway. Then are we being fair to these uh, rural people? They are producing the goods. And in any normal relationship, that is the city and the village, it must be a reciprocal type of relationship to so sustain that relationship. But I'm suggesting that it is parasitic. The people in the rural areas are producing the goods. But when it comes to the time of sharing the national cake, you don't give them some of the goodies. You don't give them the hospitals. You don't give them the clinics. You don't give them the doctors. Then what are you saying? And then in terms of imposing some of the modern institutions, like this uh, modern educational system, all their young ones are moving into the cities in terms of rural urban migration, the push-pull factor. So they are becoming anemic in the rural areas. But I think the realization is that if you don't concern yourself about the rural people, then it's just like killing the hen, which lays the golden egg. And I think the concern is very pragmatic. But before I go into the conclusion, I will also have to draw your attention to the problems of development and uh, why we are developing this type of a, a model, which will be my last point. That is, I drew your attention to the colonial period. Then I am also broadening the image that during the colonial period, you could see the statistics dropping, but at the same time, a lot of diseases came into being, which was within the context of the traditional medical healers. You see, in interaction with people, in, uh, the world has now become a stage, more or less, in terms of international travels, in terms of uh, uh, people moving from uh, the village to the city to carry on some urban jobs. There is an interplay. So they carry the infections with them. And when they are returning, they bring the infections. There is an interesting book on this by this uh, Duke University uh, uh, lecturers, uh, Hartwick and uh, uh, Patterson, Disease in African History. You see, who tells us, draws our attention uh, to the fact that uh, as a result of uh, contact with other peoples, as a result of uh, internal urban migration, where the rural workers move into the cities, when they go into the cities, they live in the shanty towns. And here, the spread of uh, epidemics is very fast. They also, as a result of their gamenshaft relationship, the we feeling, the kinship, relatives, you know, they share the same thing. One lineage is one blood. So here, there is a, a rapid stage for infection to take place. And they, we can also draw your attention to the 1918 influenza, the World War influenza. It spread all through the length and breadth of the country. So my argument then is that, you see, the traditional healers were very particularistic. The traditional healers knew certain types of uh, disease map, but as a result of the contact, new disease patterns spread to change the whole uh, diseases. And uh, I think uh, I'm suggesting that they were not able to keep up with some of these things. Right. Then also, in, the, in this quest for uh, development and people moving up and down, we are finding more of the psychological type of diseases, like mental illnesses. And studies have indicated that in the traditional medical institutions, many of the patients who go there suffer from these bizarre psychological type of diseases, mental illness, and the quest for meaning. And also, interestingly, some of them who go into the modern hospitals want to raise philosophical questions, questions of why was it that I am always sick? Why is it that, though I know your cause and effect type of theory, but why is it that we are all in this room? And when there is a cold, you didn't get it, and I got it. 
and the doctors are not able to tackle with some of these. They go probabilistic, probabilistic theories, but it is not quite uh, sufficient. Even in, in terms of tuberculosis, they tell us about the environment, the whole general environment. They tell us about nutrition. That is, if A gets it, uh, A got it because of certain deficiencies, because of poor nutrition, because of poor environment, etc. But these traditional healers will give you an insurance, for better or for worse, that within this year you have suffered too much and you need some protection. And I think, importantly, it is good for the human being when you meet someone who is concerned they inject the human factor into the therapeutic processes. They also look at the whole thing. In their treatment, as John Johnson in Kansas has made clear in his uh, book, The Quest for Therapy in the Lower Zari, he tells us, interestingly, that in many of the healers, when you visit them, the individual who is sick brings relatives and kinsmen. And to him, these people are performing crucial social functions. These people are what he called the therapy management groups. In schizophrenia psychiatry, Dr. Lambo has also drew our attention to the ARO experiment in Abiyakuta in uh, Nigeria, quite convincingly why the African mental patient uh, does not easily break down. He tells us, interestingly, the support systems this man has. So with all these type of uh, little examples, we get into an understanding of a comprehensive view of man. We get into a, an understanding of the human factor. And here in a comparative interaction analysis, we get a look at scientific medicine. It is an aspect of technological growth. I have suggested that it, it has helped all of us. There's no doubt about it. But I think for us to look at this organization, technological organization, which is so efficient, we need to criticize it to, so that the people within it can improve it. The people within it, I'm talking about the, uh, the research scientists, the research doctors, because they have got the technology. And I think if they become less complacent, there is a hope for us. We get into situations. There has been studies where the family in the quest for therapy, he has to see the poor mother, 35 years old, or the husband. Maybe she is alone with two children. She has to see the ear specialist. She has to see the nose specialist. She has to see the orthopedic specialist. She has to see the stomach specialist. She has to see any so many ex-specialists, <coughs> cost, energy, and time. And the frustration, too, and the development of new syndrome, I suggest, in the quest for therapy. And these are some of the practical questions that we should raise in order to understand where are we, in order for us to understand that there is now a need to look at a broadening base, in order for us to understand that we shouldn't be complacent with this present system of scientific reductionistic theoretical focus. So for that reason, in conclusion, in Ghana, with the help of a World Health Organization, USAID, international agencies, and others, Ghana government signed a contract, five-year contract, to look at the community participation approach. And this is a very pragmatic uh, result of the in unequal distribution of uh, health resources to these rural areas. So the argument now is that uh, we need to look at the rural areas and find a health model which is based on community participation approach. Community participation approach. That means that the locals must get involved in making decisions. The locals must also get involved in management the decisions they have made. This is a shift from the dominant theory, from the theory who say, which says that only the city dwellers professionals know what is right for these rural people. And here the empirical basis for this uh, a shift is interesting because I have suggested in my analysis that 
the rural people in Ghana, you see, when we call them illiterates, they are no, they, they, they have organization. I have mentioned the cocoa industry. I have mentioned the granite industry. And so what are we saying that we people in Accra, we people in Lagos know what is best for these people in the rural areas? They are feeding us. And we have a parasitic type of relationship. So why don't we trust them to look for new paradigms? I think this is the basis of the whole thing. This trickle-down theory, this top-bottom-down theory, is based into it is arrogance of some sort. But I'm not saying that the people at the top should not help the people down there. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there is a need to look at the community participation approach. The main uh, uh, results, I mean, are being published. But I think uh, the one I quoted, um, Mike Warren et al. in Medical Anthropology Newsletter, November 1979, is interesting aspect of this whole general concept. But what we did in the Contempo project, that is the community participation, is to go in there as change agent, look at the client systems, find out ways and means with a traditional social structure. And Ghana is very interesting that they have a village organization. The history, you read it from uh, Ivo Wicks, uh, you read it from Ratri, Ashanti, you read it from uh, Dahomey, Heskovis Dahomey, and others. You get to see that the traditional area, they have got a decision-making councils, chiefs, and their elders. So we have to use their own councils to form this basis for participation. And then also, I think ideas from a, a Chinese model, though there again, Chinese ideology is different, Chinese social structure is different, and so we cannot compare these social structures. But symbolically, the Chinese uh, model has broken the myth that only doctors can heal. It's important for us to break myths, you see. Here is China, faced with about 90% of its people in the rural areas, and they develop the barefoot doctors to live on the rice farms and uh, do their medicine and healing. And that also gives us a symbolic idea. But I think coming back to the community participation approach is also the concept of comprehensiveness. That is a holistic approach. That is integrative. That is now health is not a thing which we should. Doctors are important people still. But I think we need to help doctors the food we eat, nutrition, agriculture, the whole environment is important. You see, there is a, a book written by uh, Mulder, Gunnar Mulder, Asian drama, which uh, tells us quite clearly the nature of the interrelationship between health and economic factors. Formerly, we thought you go into the hospital, you get your shot, you come back, and then you can continue to do your own thing like we have described in Ghana. The person has got schistosomiasis, rehysia. He drank or he played in a, a dirty water. He came to Accra. Two weeks, he is cured. He took his bed. He's come back. And then he's continued to be in his own environment, isn't it? And so what are we doing? So for that reason, when you look at the cost aspect of it, more people will be attending hospitals. For the government, it is very cheap because the government uh, have the drugs, if they have the drugs. And uh, when you come, you do it. Instead of these governments, to shift the emphasis from the curative to the preventive, they don't. The preventive will mean developing the marketplaces. The preventive will mean building marketplaces devoid of swarms of flies. The preventive will mean building a real habitable environment. The preventive will mean giving them modern water supply. But in the, law, in the short run, it's expensive for these governments. But in the long run, it is inexpensive. Because many of these diseases are infectious diseases. They are malnutritional diseases. They are communicable diseases. But the government is cheap in the sense that you do cheap things. And I'm suggesting that in terms of the community participation model, the argument is being made that we should look at it from a broad comprehensive aspect, not to make these narrow pragmatic distinctions about curative uh, preventive. Here, the questions will be quite clear that this is too general. But I'm just trying to focus your attention that at least we know that the reductionistic uh, theory needs to be broadened. So in conclusion, my argument is that we are now getting into the community participation in health, and we are going to use the locals, which studies have started five years ago, 
ended 79. The locals had organization. They selected uh, their own interested uh, people within the environment. And also, they selected the traditional healers. You see, the traditional healers have got uh, associations. They know who is a traditional healer. The traditional healers have got some loose associations. But within the concept of the three or four uh, specialists I have mentioned, there are a whole series of infighting in this traditional healing uh, concept. But I think, uh, importantly, the traditional healers, most of them are practicing on their own. It is very difficult to get them into some associ associational forms. The associations uh, began in Ghana with the advent of the first government, which saw really the need to look for this uh, traditional healing mechanism. And for that reason, the, the government helped to establish, you have a distinct, the Herbalist Association, and the, those who add spiritual healing with the herbalism also form associations. But I would say that within the context of a traditional society, illiterates and also through the oral tradition, it is very difficult to monitor this type of uh, associations in reality. So then, in, in conclusion, the community participation approach trained the people in a rural environment, you see. We, we, there was a shift from an integration model. An integration model will add these traditional uh, people we train to the urban, and you can predict with a certain amount of certainty that they will move to Accra to where the action is. I always say to where the disco is, you see. And they will ask for promotions, like, and will ask for you know, a stratification system. So here it's a question of looking at traditional medicine in terms of articulation, looking at its uh, positive aspect. We trained them, and we were worried what to do with them. But the local councils, that is uh, the village development councils, are now looking after the pay, the sanctions, and also monitoring to see whether we can do something with this broad image I have uh, described. Then the government at its end will also look at the supply of uh, drugs, uh, monitoring the system, and have a relationship of some sort. These uh, people we trained as a first line primary healthcare attendant are also uh, been told to relate with the district. Then on this uh, uh, last point of the traditional birth attendants, uh, which has been described by Warren and others in this uh, medical anthropology newsletter. It was very easy to train these tra uh, traditional birth attendants. And my own guess is because of uh, they do something specific, you know, and the doctors like people who deal with the material specific. They do with deliveries. It's specific. You can count. And, but what is important about it is that they have been trained. And with the help of other agencies, UNICEF and others, they have been given small little bags to improve on their deliveries. And this is the beginning of the new way. So in conclusion, I'm saying then that when we analyze scientific medical institutions or biomedicine, we are analyzing it in good faith, that there is a need for it with its technology, with its experts, to embrace a new model of some sort or to work towards a new model to broaden this image so that we can shift from the reductionistic to a more comprehensive place so that the man, society, and then the environment will be in good alignment. Because if we don't do that, then like, like a prophet, we can say that it is going to be very difficult and we may perish like the dinosaurs. Thank you.